Hey, everybody, thank you for coming. Thank you for coming and enjoying the show and being a part of the Artist Talk and, and getting to meet us and us getting to meet you and just getting to interact. That's my favorite part of all of this is getting to interact and hear everybody's opinions and some life stories and history and all that kind of stuff. Um, but I, I really wanted to take this opportunity to thank MSA for giving us this space for the summer to be able to do this in. Um, without them, this wouldn't be here and we wouldn't have a spot. So thank you very much to MSA. And I want to thank Claire for leading your voice to the entire show. Um, when you walk around and see little books in the show, that's Claire reading off everything. She's phenomenal to work with. It was wonderful. Um, I don't think we had a hiccup. I sent you scripts and you sent me audio and we, it was good. Um, but being able to, to communicate and get in contact with artists from all across the state of Mississippi that are working and doing really, really good, important work across our state today has been an important part of my journey to being that. So I, I really can't tell you how much I appreciate all of you being a part of all of this. Um, but I wanted to give everybody an opportunity to know everybody. So if you want to, we'll start with Madeline. If you want to give us... <laughs> Well, my name is Madeline Wagner. I live in Brandon. I'm not from Mississippi, but I've been here for a few years. Now it's starting to feel like home. I have a house here, so we're going to make it my place. <laughs> Maurice. Uh, Maurice Calvert. How y'all doing? I'm originally from Colorado Springs, Colorado, but I've been here over half my life now. Married with two beautiful children, and this is my home. I'm not relocating to Jackson, North Texas, so glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you for being here. You're also one of our, the instructors here. Oh, yeah. Yeah, like generation after generation, yeah. showing the good stuff. Claire? Yes, Claire Ishii Um I am author of I Hear the Black Raven, and I'm from So So, Mississippi. Hey, everybody. I'm Abriza. I grew up in Jackson, moved to Hattiesburg to go to school, and got stuck there. If you don't know me yet, my name is Derek. I grew up here in Brookhaven and I moved away and did some traveling and then moved back about three years ago and uh, opened up a little studio here that I get to play and teach out of and this is kind of what's grown out of that. Um, I, for for the, the artist talk, I really kind of wanted to just go through and give everyone's personal experience. Um, you know, not only with the show, but their thought process behind their piece of art. Um, maybe a little bit, I mean, you never know, oh, yeah. um, maybe a little bit about how you work or how, how um, your ideas spark about or what you even thought when you saw the call for art, just to kind of get everything started off. Anybody want to take off? Can I guess I'm going for it. Um, so when I saw the call for art, and I saw this opportunity, um, you know, my, actually my father, he's big in the music, and really a lot of jazz. Some blues here, I've done them like the blues, and so I went on the website, started looking for the music, and started playing the music in my class. I actually offered an opportunity to my students. I said, look, maybe I should think about trying to draw one of these So just listening to it, and the song that came out to me that I've heard over and over again was The Thrill is Dog. It's the song that came out you know, about the relationship, and finally getting done with that relationship, seeing it for what it was. And I was on my way to the Grammy Museum on a field trip, actually, um, in the Delta. And on the way to the Delta, I saw this house, or it looks like a house, and um, it was abandoned, of course, run down. The grass is growing up everywhere. And you just start imagining and perceiving what it used to be. Uh, the life that used to be there. The people that used to be there. Uh, it's on a whole bunch of acreage. It's really a standalone place, something. You're separated from everything, but you're 
used to be a beautiful place. And I'm thinking about in Jackson, and brought up like abandoned buildings and houses. And like, those places used to be occupied, and they used to be beautiful. Like every rundown place we see used to be beautiful at one point. But the thrill is gone. That relationship with that place, with that person, came to an end. And this is what it came to. So I thought about, when I think about, and not all the time, but when I perceive my artwork, and when I'm thinking perceptually, I think about things I've been through, um, you know, things we go through, places we travel to, people we talk to, that affects what we're thinking about at the time, or, and relationships or whatever. So I thought about that abandoned building. I got out of the I didn't drive on the bus because I live in Jackson. I, I drive down here every, every day from Jackson to Brookhaven. So I didn't have to go on the bus. So the opportunity to drive by myself. So when I saw this building, I stopped several times. So I saw a lot of places in that were interesting. There's actually another one, Blues Museum, tiny like little shack house. Yeah. I know what I'm talking about. But I stopped and I just, I didn't have no art supply. I couldn't do art on the scene. So I just took a lot of reference. So I walked up to the house, I took a video of it, and I used it as a reference. And when I think about colors, of course, you know, the warm color scheme, and, you know, the meanings behind these colors, and the clash between the good and the bad. So you see warm tones, and you see the cool tones dominating, and stuff like that. Because of the coldness or the, what used to be that's no longer there, and there's some like, really rough. Rush strokes. It was a clear day, it wasn't cloudy, it wasn't stormy, but I put so many strokes that were kind of vibrant. Um, just reminiscent of what the life that used to be there that's no longer there. So that's kind of the story behind that piece. Um, that it used to be an occupied, beautiful place, but now it's abandoned and separate from everybody and everything. And it's forgotten. Yeah. It's interesting. To, to hear you talk about the buildings that way because uh, a part of the story, the narrative of this when, when I was putting it all together, because people send you a ton of artwork and then you have to filter through it. It's like, okay, well, what can make up a, a show? Um, and one of the biggest things that I learned from putting this together was that, you know, if artists, if our Mississippi blues musicians had been treated right in the 20s and 30s, Clarksdale, Mississippi would be one of the richest places in the country. You know, none of that would have been so barely doing that. Who else wants to talk about that? Yeah, okay, I'll talk about my work. Um, so I did a lot of layering with this and the thought process behind it was just how to get the colors to interact the way that is pleasing, I guess. Um, so yeah, I use transparency papers and alcohol ink, which gives you like that, a lot of different tones. And yeah, the juice strips as like, it's just the influence of Robert Johnson. I was first introduced to this as like, of course, many people are. I feel like Led Zeppelin. And it just made me think about, you know, the lids, all the acid rock, all the things that happen. And you, you based yours off of lyrics, didn't you? Yes. Yeah. Nice. Wonderful. And where does that talk about yours? Um, yeah, that's my print that I did in this show. And um, typically, when I start a new print, it's from either a photograph I've taken myself. I've spent a lot of time in New Orleans. It's a big inspiration behind all of this. It goes back to college. I found a lot of really cool aspects within the architecture of the house and kind of how in New Orleans is. You have these big, beautiful houses, but sometimes they're abandoned and sometimes nature is starting to reclaim what man has built. And that one in particular, I'm a big music person, so when I'm listening or when I'm working, I usually have music playing. And I think either when I was carving or when I was creating the initial drawing, Dr. John saw the Mama Root came on. And, well, Dr. John is not originally from this state. He did spend some time here and I'm sure interacted with other artists from this area and had influence on them. So it just kind of made me think about this house and how the song kind of fit with it. It has kind of a witchy kind of welcoming yet enter with caution. I don't 
appeal to me, and that's kind of what I tried to go for with that one. Hopefully, I'm going to make a colored version of it soon, which I think kind of carries a little more atmosphere with it. Um, I, I want to switch gears off of the show for a little bit, just to, to have, I, I don't get surrounded by this many artists at a time anymore, so like, I love to get everybody's opinions on things, and I would really just like to know your take on what it's like being an artist in Mississippi right now. Think about it. You know, we don't have to judge, but there's, there's a lot to consider, and especially in each individual place that we live. Um, I know here in Berkhaven, it's it's been nice to move back. I have, you know, I have a, a good amount of support, but the experiences of everyone around me, for instance, the museum experiences, so building building those types of things, haven't been as easy to get across to the public as classes or you know things like that. So I'd like to hear any of your own personal experiences about you being an artist in Mississippi. It's a little bit of both 
by the nature of printmaking, a lot of times you have multiples of what you're making. Sometimes it's easy to find a home for these things. Sometimes it's not. You know, Mississippi is not one of the wealthiest states in the United States, so there's that barrier to you. So I don't know. It, it's both. But I'm also a teacher full time, so it's a little difficult. So, you know, um, it, kind of like you guys were saying, it's a little difficult to find the resources within where you are, especially if you want to continue to have a career in that field that I found personally in Hattiesburg, these opportunities are really hard to find. And it, it's, I guess you have to dig, you kind of don't have to, don't give up, but just keep doing your thing regardless of what happens. Just do it for you. It's a hard thing to learn, um, to, to be able to do art for yourself and, and not necessarily for others all the time. Um, but when you do finally learn it, it's a little bit further. I mean, you went, you, you've got visual arts, you've got literature, you've got, like, what's that been? Wow. So, um, so I haven't really, like, like a lot of participants here, I haven't really tried to push selling my art, but I have entered into, like, a couple of different art shows. Like, I've had it, um, had some art in the Meridian Museum of Art. They had a competition. I had a piece there, um, and there was a, a competition on the coast that I got first place in one of the region. And, um, I was trying to think of other places that I've had it shown. Oh, there was a Black History, a pop up Black History Museum in Mall, Mississippi, that I also had some art display. And I've, I've gotten good reaction from my art. My, the art that I was showing was good work, it was like kind of like a three-dimensional, I cut out wood, put the wood collage, I would say. Wood collage is kind of like what I would, how I would describe it. And I've gotten a pretty good reaction from it, and people, people, I think people find it interesting because they don't see a lot of woodwork, per se, sort of in the surrounding areas. So people kind of ask me, what do you charge or do you do this for other people? And I've considered doing that like kind of customizing some pieces, but um, I don't know. That's the that's the extent of my of me working in art. Um, I wanted to, to take the next little bit of time to kind of open it up if anybody has questions for any individual artist. Um, Maurice, if you didn't catch on this painting, this is the far one here hanging. And then this is Abrisa's, and this is Madeline's. And then Claire is our narrator, and she has just released her own book. So if anybody would like to open the floor, if anybody would like to ask any questions. I'll ask a question. I want to know the story that this picture is done. I like what you said that the lemons, just like acid, rock, so it's kind of acidic. So that's cool. Um, okay, so yeah. <laughs> okay, so I started off with these little circles, and they were originally going to be the lemons, and then it just kind of lost itself. So I thought about how can I really incorporate this artist into my piece? So you have the different portraits of him, and I just digitally edited some of this stuff. But this is just your regular guitar, and it has all the colors because he was such a master of the Delta Blues, such an influence on rock and roll. And so, yeah. But that's like a good. That's it. Yeah. Okay. I'm trying to think of the ass and the psychic. Well, I don't know the story. No, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, because it trips when you get down here. Right. I was like, who's tripping? So I'm just trying to see. Go ahead. I love it. Um, yeah. I think the apple one really lends itself to that because of its just nature and it plays with each other and the colors so well. Um, but yeah, I used to date this guy, and he was like a guitar player who really wanted to master everything because he was a narcissist. But 
he, he was the one who introduced me to Robert Johnson because he's super in love with Led Zeppelin. He's like, oh, I learned to play this uh, traveling Riverside blues and I really want to learn to slide and stuff, all that. And so, like, okay, that's where it came from. And yeah, we do a lot of yeah, I knew it was a box store. It was a story. Like, <laughs> was it was Mylon? Used to the Mylon things? Oh, yeah, just transparency. Mm -hmm. Like oh, a transparency paper. Like an alcohol. Mm -hmm. And you could mention the lyrics. Like, oh, yeah. yeah. So it's called Squeeze My Lemon Baby. And you know, it's a metaphor for hand job. And so that's why uh, the limits are also drinking. Oh, okay. <laughs> Layers. <laughs> Layers. <laughs> Layers. <laughs> you asked me. I asked that one. Hello? Who's that? Well, great. let me, if you don't mind, let me turn it back on you for a second. Huh? What did you see happen before you asked? Well, once you said something about the citrus and the acid, well, the acid, and I got citrus, and I was like, mm. It's like acid rock, okay, so then the colors. I wanted to know that, you know, I just wanted to know the colors were they supposed to be like psychedelics or, you know, what was the story behind the colors? Because, you know, if you look around, not everywhere you see hot pink and hot green and aqua blue and stuff, so I just wanted to know what one layer feel those colors and stuff. It was yeah. the summertime and all that kind of thing. Awesome. Anybody else have any questions? For those of you that like, aren't originally from Mississippi, I'm curious how moving here has shaped your point of view or your voice um, in some way. Like, what have you, how, how has this place challenged you or changed the way you thought about yourself? Good question. Madeline's getting into politics now. <laughs> I've met, um, I used to work for a charity in Jackson before I just went to part time, not big marketing career plans. Um, so I've seen a lot of the underserved people, even in like Jackson, the capital. There's just so many people that don't have a voice or their voice is not represented in, not represented or unheard. So I'm running for alternate in a couple years. <laughs> Start small. I grew up here, but I know like leaving and being gone for 16 years and then turning around and coming back, it felt like I never lived here at all. Like I remembered everything, but the rest of everywhere else I lived had just been so different. And for me personally, when I moved away, I made sure that I moved outside of the communities I was most used to. Um, I grew up here in an all-white private academy and you know, went straight from college. And the, the first experiences I had with other cultures were my high school waiting tables. And then when I moved, I moved to Orlando. And that's one of the bigger melting pots in Florida. And it was the best experience I've ever done. You know, getting to, to just sink in and have communities, like super, super diverse communities, going over to this house and being invited here and being able, you know, the welcoming that they had was just completely different from anybody else's that I've been experienced to. And moving back here, it was almost like, you know, we don't say we do it, but here's all of our boxes and you go in this one and they go in this one. And so it's been difficult. You know, it's really been difficult to come back in and kind of you go back into this box and you know, kick in the string on the box door. So, no, no, this is not my box. This is, you know, there should be no walls. <laughs> so it's been really interesting to get to get used to it now. I don't know. It's, uh, it just depends on the Coming from Colorado, coming down here, 20, we're about 20 years old, something like that, 19, 20. Um, first, when I came down, my uncle, he's a comedian. He did a show here before from Denver. 
And before I came down here, you heard nothing but bad about Mississippi. He said he would never come here again. I'm not going to say everything he said, but he said he'd never come here again. And um, so initially, I was kind of afraid, like, well, should I go there? But one of my best friends came from Meridian. I knew about Jackson State. I'm a football fan. I'm going to play football. I went to Jackson State. Short story. I went to Jackson State. What's weird is now that I'm the age that I am now, I'm 40 now, so I've been here half my life. Um, this is my home. It's weird because I see kids from Mississippi that cannot wait to leave Mississippi. It's the same everywhere. I'm from Colorado. I could not wait to leave Colorado. As beautiful as Colorado was, it's a pretty place. Um, there's discontentment. No matter where you're from. So seeing that when I came down here, um, I've learned to be content where I am. If you go to a bigger city, it just has more of what Mississippi has. That's the only difference. New York has more clubs. There's clubs here. You see what I'm saying? It's just a bigger version of the same exact thing here, which Breeds more opportunity, but this is my perspective. I'm not trying to put my perspective on y'all. And so I've learned, and, yet, and I was a bad kid. I stole a lot. Y'all don't even know all that, but you know, when I was growing up, I got in trouble a lot. When I came down here, my whole life changed. I got saved down here. And I know this is the Bible, but we don't want to get down there. I'm just telling you my side. Right? But my life changed. My life changed for the good. My life changed for the good down here. No more court, no more paying $500 fines down, from down here in my life. Everyone wants to leave. And I think about all the famous people that's from Mississippi that left Mississippi. There's so many famous people from Mississippi that will not come back, but you're, you're, what ended up becoming was from here. I'm related to Oprah Winfrey. She doesn't know that, but she's from Mississippi. Like, a lot of good comes from here and it comes from my struggle. So that's my perspective, my point of view. I'm glad I'm from, I'm not from here, I'm glad I'm here. Because if I move, the only thing that's gonna change is my, the view of what I see, mountains, water, bigger buildings, maybe a little bit more opportunities. But what I can, what I can get there, I have here. Personally, again, I'm not trying to put it on nobody, but, that's how I've seen Mississippi. And I've seen me want to leave, my friends want to leave, Colorado's boring, Colorado Springs sucks, Mississippi sucks, Jackson sucks. I can't wait to leave, it's the same thing. So. Excuse me. Yeah. Me, he met me and that. <laughs> 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 yeah, that is true. Sorry. Yeah. That is true. So. I mean, I enjoy it. I've learned to enjoy the heat. I used to hate it. <laughs> but now I go out and say, I'm a sweat team. <laughs> and you can't beat the cost of living. Yeah, cost of living is great. And you, you have so many more opportunities that you can do with the amount of money that you can make because cost of living. Is so I've had a good student, some students follow me on Facebook and vice versa. And he put out a comment when you know, they started talking about living in the of California. $15 in California, I said, you forgot how much it costs to live in California. Like, people don't think about these things. So. I don't think there's as many job opportunities for young people. Um, true. Particular professional people. It's true. In the old towns in Mississippi. That is true. I was trying to say I didn't. Yeah. Like, that's the way it is. The lucky things about, you know, have, uh, uh, again, it, cost less to make your own opportunity. You know, where when I was living in Orlando or when I was living in North Carolina, even Wellington, North Carolina, which isn't the most expensive of all the places, I, I couldn't even save up the amount of money that it took to open up a little spot, you know, which here it's been a lot easier. You know, so some of these little town spots that we can get it all going, you know, that really I mean, look at Brookhaven. And if you haven't had a chance to, or if you're not from here, just all you have to do is go one more block and make a right in this gorgeous downtown area. You know, just ready for something to do. 
and it's just waiting for those things to happen. And they'll happen here quicker than they'll happen in places just because we can we have a little bit of extra leeway on what we can. We get more bang for our buck here. You know, so if we need a contractor to come in and, and frame out something and do something for us there, it's a little bit less here than it is in those bigger places, which gives us a little bit more opportunity. I would like to, even though I'm from Mississippi, so I know your question was for people who moved from out of state to here, but um, I, I would like to kind of say that there's opportunity through social media to like get out, get out of Mississippi and try to bring some of that here because I wasn't able to like get, um, uh, connect with other artists, like people to get, get visuals for my own art from out of state, from Instagram or from Facebook. And I've also gotten the opportunity to interview someone who is a, a comic book, he's a comic book owner from like um, California or somewhere. I connected through, to him through social media to get outside of my sphere of Mississippi. So there's the opportunity um, in different places. You just have to look. Especially to have to reach. Yeah. You know, it's surprisingly easy to reach out and touch somebody now. And you can find a picture and everything about them. It's not just flipping through the phone book anymore. Yeah. But you know, I think it's going to be a most solid thing for you know, yeah, social media, just the internet in general. From Mississippi, you can push them like what you're doing. It's awesome. You don't push your hard work. Yeah, this is. If, um, you know, anything about the internet can, can show you. This show, as of today, has been viewed almost 4,000 times on the um, We've had around, we're, we're getting close between between my count and MSA doing their thing during the day. We're around 300 people walking through foot traffic, um, but 4,000 people we got to, to go through and they got to hear voices, they got to hear artists' voices and statements and connect back to social media and you know whatever we can do to build connections back to our artists and put forward is what I would really, really want to focus on. If anybody has any other questions? I was just wondering if y'all have a website set up with your art club there. It's a 2021 goal. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on the grand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, the world is our oyster, and, you know, I think y'all would be bound to be I made one to the bound and recreated it with the same name. So, my name's Marlies. I stole it. I took Mo's, M O E S Art, Mozart, Mozart. That's what the name of my website would be. So I have to put Drip at the end because someone took Mozart already, but, but that will be the name of mine because I'm always. Yeah. 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 Up, that's in your control. They can't take any of that away from you. 
So definitely, I please recommend going and building out some kind of version of a website that's going to be blown. I tried. I'm, I'm not consistent enough. No, I can barely newsletter. <laughs> but um, blogging is just play. Um, I do the podcast, though. We should be starting up soon again. Um, if anybody has any other questions, if not, I was going to give it over to, to Claire to kind of read some passages out of our book and, and bring it all to a close for us. Yes, so I have selected three passages. Um, they vary in length, but um, I would just like to read them all for you, and I hope that you can enjoy something out of them. Black Raven, stay a while with me. Teach me your song. It echoes and leads me like breadcrumbs. Evolution of mind, cemented in time, gone as quickly as you appear, your croaking fingers in my ear. Pray. <clears throat> the black raven is symbolic for many cultures around the world. Some view it as an omen of good, others as a sign of foreboding. Some see it as a divine messenger, a communicator of cosmic secrets and deep mysteries. It is associated with the pursuit of knowledge and wisdom. It is a highly intelligent and sourceful creature with the ability to create tools to be a movie. It can represent shape shifting, the ability to transform, and it can represent the mystery of the void, the black hole in space that draws matter and energy to itself and releases it in different forms. When we have an experience, we are quick to label that experience as good or bad. But every experience in life is just that and experience, set in motion from the inception of our world. Like a pebble thrown into a body of water, events began and their effects ripple into an indefinite future. An event can be compared to a single domino. A domino is neither good nor bad. When it falls, it is simply reacting to a stimulus. The reaction is labeled as good or bad by the person observing, and their perception of the reaction is having an effect that is beneficial or one that is undesirable. Events are always happening. We are always experiencing life. How we deal with, process, and incorporate these experiences of what gives them meaning. We cannot see the future and determine immediately how the experience will ultimately fit in our personal narrative, but we can take each moment we live for what it is and consider it a growth opportunity or a chance to pivot. There is a black raven constantly appearing in each of our lives, making its utterance. It could be near now. Can you hear it? What is it revealing to you? Do you hear a pleasant sound? Does it disturb you? The black raven utters, but we decide how we hear it. We choose how we view and react to our experiences in the same way. Listen to the raven. The dam, well built, could not withstand the raging flood, and bursting forth, released a force that flowed unchecked. Chapter 2, Break to Freedom. I had a car accident. That was the story circulating about me when I returned to work. I had been absent for four months, and somehow this excuse for my hiatus was invented. Was it the truth? Absolutely not. Was I complaining? Hell no. This invented story was a million times better than the story of what actually occurred. I accepted this as a, as a gift, a safety net for my landing back into normal life. But it was awkward trying to explain details of a car accident that never took place. When people asked about what happened, I lied and gave scant details. And if pressed for further information, I had nothing else to provide. Some asked details about what happened to the car. Was it totaled? In what direction was the car hit? How did you feel when all this was happening? This made keeping up the lie difficult, but I did not dare reveal the hard truth. My supervisor sat me down and asked if I wanted coworkers to know that I needed some space as I was getting back up to speed. I replied with a resounding yes. Four months prior, 
I made headlines in the local newspapers for my uncanny behavior and a series of unfortunate events that weighed heavily on me. I had endured my second psychotic episode, and the incident was no secret around my hometown. Looking back, I shouldn't be surprised at what happened. The pressure on my mind and body had been building for some time. I had been suffering from severe anxiety and poor sleep. My work relationships had begun to suffer. During lunch, I resorted to taking naps on my office floor or driving to a store parking lot. I would climb into the back seat of my vehicle and hope to pass out and get blessed from my mind. I had become highly avoided and often left for early without a valid excuse. The night of November 5th, 2014, my father made a two and a half hour trip from Mississippi to Alabama, where I was currently living, to retreat. I was 25 and losing myself. I was scared. I was in great need of rest. I had ascended into mania over the course of the day. My parents found my supervisor's information on my phone and handled the process of getting me off work to recover. The next morning, my mother prepared for work. The original plan was for me to stay at home alone. My mother left for work, but something told her to turn around and come back to keep watch over me. I marveled at a remarkable creature. Upon my approach, it startled and leapt across the goal. In pursuit of study, I leapt as well, and falling short, I landed on the rocky ground between us. Chapter 4, A Chasm Too Wide. I want Victor to see me naked. Where is Victor? I couldn't keep my gown on and didn't want to. I was 26 and found myself in a room of senior hospital psychiatric unit. I was in the room next to the front desk with the hidden door. Usually these rooms are reserved for difficult patients. A little less than a year after my diagnosis, I had experienced yet another psychotic break, and the co-star of this episode was none other than Victor. I first met Victor while I was on a co-op assignment. He was a rising star who worked full-time at the refinery. At our first meeting, he was laid back and a bit reserved. We didn't exactly hit it off, but he wasn't anything near it to me. There was just no spark, nothing in particular that drew me to him. I didn't run into him often over the years of my co-op assignment, but I was aware of his presence. When I started full-time at the refinery at age 24, I became more acquainted with Victor although he proved to be an impenetrable fortress. We both ended up in leadership positions for a popular employee network. We attended work learning sessions together, and we even shared one lunch alone together. My interest in Victor did not come immediately, but rather as a slow build, a result of repeated encounters of growing familiarity. As I repeatedly observed him in his work environment, in downtime, and interacting with colleagues, I began to put together the bits and pieces, clues that helped form my view of him. I noticed that I became more excited to see him whenever I passed him in the halls, sat next to him in a learning session, visited his office, or when he visited mine. Victor was a very attractive young man. He stood at a height of about 6'2". He was dark-skinned with short hair. He had a booming voice, along with the build of the walk of the athlete. When he was around, he took up space. He was highly intelligent, dedicated to his work, and very orderly. He was a man's man, having established close and lasting relationships with his male colleagues. I also found him to have a slightly geeky side, which I believe he tried to mask for the purposes of appearing professional. Everyone loved Victor. On occasions he visited my office, we often engaged in some type of philosophical discussion. For example, he played the drum set and was an excellent player. We discussed this once. He talked about how he didn't feel as though he was very good, to which I responded, who defines what is good? We pursued this debate for a little while, my position being that we are ultimate judges of our own work. It is possible this conversation made him a little uncomfortable as he left abruptly, but with a smile on his face. As we became more acquainted, he confided he confided in very small things in me, and I confided in things in him. 
I took note of a few special encounters we had. One day when we were in my office, he clumsily tripped over the wastebasket. I chuckled at this and wondered if I'd make him nervous. Another time, we met in the lunch area. I was wearing my hair in a short fro. He commented, I love it. I expressed my thanks for this compliment. Once more, we met in the lunch area. We talked about some of the adventures I had with my good friend Basil, who also worked there. Richard may have been under the impression that I didn't hang out with work friends very often. He may have even been a little jealous of the express. What do I have to do to get you to spend time with me? To which I replied, just ask. And then he swiftly walked away. I think this last interaction was a turning point. I never really developed a sexual attraction to him, but he was always appearing in my dreams. In one particular dream, I sat gracefully in his lap, hence we embraced, and that was his summer day. I awakened from these dreams with a feeling of serenity. I wanted to cook for him. If I was teetering before, I had not toppled in a big delay. Little did I know, I would soon be exiled. <laughs> Claire has a table in back where she's got some of her books for sale and then also is happy to sign any, anything. Um, that's pretty much it for what I had planned. If anybody else wants to say anything, more than welcome to. Um, and then just hang out and have a good time. Thank you all so much for coming. At this point, we're going to disband this and just enjoy the show. Thank you.